Wow, we are back and we have something special for you. Um, as much as we love the mighty humble pie, um, what a special treat. We have the co-founder, the drummer extraordinaire. Um, you know him, you love him, all the songs, the great Jerry Shirley. Jerry, you have blessed us with an, an amazing uh, new treat for all the humble pie fans. And even though we play the records on a regular basis and uh, celebrate those incredible performances in the studio and, of course, at the Fillmore on the Performance Rock and the Fillmore album, um, you have uh, sanctioned and handpicked uh, four new members that you yeah. feel and have passed the test that can really bring the spirit of Humble Pie to the stage here now and in person. Um, I, I know it's been hard ever since the loss of, of Steve Marriott, rest in peace, um, that um, you couldn't perform these songs like you wanted to, but um, you have found an absolutely amazing band um, led by Dave Bucket Colwell and of course, Jim Stapley and uh, Ivan Bodley on bass and the great Bobby Marks on drums. And, you know, being a fellow drummer, he's uh He's uh, a kid in a candy store, learning from the yep. master himself. And I always uh, reference your book. I love the title, The Best Seat in the House, because Mr. Jerry Shirley, if you can imagine, is banging those drums, looking out at that audience with in front of him, Steve Marriott, Peter Frampton, Clem Clemson, and Greg Ridley. What a seat. But talk about yeah. the, the new band. And you feel that um, obviously we've seen the – the demise and the uh, farewell tours and so many of our classic bands from the seventies are gone. Aerosmith on their farewell tour, Kiss on their farewell tour, Leonard Skinner on their farewell tour. Um, but you have in the humble pie legacy, really the spirit of the band. Of course, nobody can yeah. replace you and Steve and Greg and Clem and Peter, but this is the next best thing. Um, yeah. talk, talk about yeah. uh, your excitement for the legacy band and um, what what a treat that the uh, music lovers are in for. Well, it, it, first of all, we're paying tribute to the legacy of the music, but it is Humble Pie. It is the new lineup of Humble Pie, and we are uh, adding to it Humble Pie legacy, meaning the legacy of the music. But, you know, while it is... It's not a tribute band. The, a tribute band is a band that's got nothing to do with the original band whatsoever, whereas this is a band that's been handpicked by me. I would be playing drums, but I can I can no longer do so to the standard of which I would want to because of physical reasons. Uh, my hips were replaced, and when they were replaced, I found that I could walk fine. I've got my mobility back, but I couldn't play drums for long periods of time, um, which was a bit of a cruel irony, but it meant that if I couldn't play 90 minutes at my best and I wanted to keep the band out there playing live and I do own the name, so I wanted to make sure we were doing it and not someone else who had nothing to do with the band. Bucket had already been in Humble Pie the last time we were together with Greg Ridley in 2000 and 2001 when we recorded an album called Back on Track. And at that time, we had Bobby Tench in the band, and he'd been in with us years before on On to Victory. So we came up with the idea of finding people who were just as good at, at their, I mean, for instance, um, Ivan, the bass player, is top draw. He has been with uh, Sam and Dave, or Sam of Sam and Dave, as his musical director for years. He's, you know, and all, well, that's all I needed to hear about him because if he is playing Stax Records, artists music and his musical director um that was it for me and it turned out his playing was perfect because 
Stax music and Duck Dum, the bass player, was Greg's favourite bass player. So he was a perfect fit. Bobby Marks is just like me re reincarnated somehow. I mean, he's, he's just got that same power. He's got that same backbeat feel. And um, he's dedicated to the cause. And this is the main thing. They're all huge fans of Humble Pie. Dave Bucket Colwell, who's my dear friend and the band leader, is the guy that does for me on the road what I can't do because I'm not there while I'm looking after it at home along with Steve Carras, the manager, and uh, Gary Bucks, the agent. Uh, we're looking after all the promotional side of it and... Uh, etc but what they have put together in a very short space of time live um and recorded it in rehearsals um which you've seen is just absolutely the they've captured the essence of the band perfectly so it is the way it's built is jerry shirley presents humble pie legacy the truth is, it's Jerry Shirley presents the new Humble Pie. You know, um, the legacy of the music is a way of us saying we're not trying to say this is the original band because obviously it's not. But it is players that are playing it the way the original band played. And that's as good as we can get. You know, we we can't get the original band out there. Two of them are no longer with us. Peter's got his own health issues and his own career. Clem also has got his own career with Coliseum at the moment. And I could only play for a song or two. But what we are hoping to do as it progresses is on special occasions and maybe do it for charitable reasons on these one-off gigs we're hoping to do would be for Peter, myself, Clem and Chad Smith, my friend from the Ch Red Hot Chili Peppers. If on certain gigs, and not on this upcoming tour, I doubt, but as we go along, we want to use this as a vehicle to do special nights where we have a lot of the musicians that either were in the band that can still manage a song or two, sort of thing, or fans of the band, people like Chad, who is the first to admit he learned how to play by listening to the live album. And his brother, Brad, wouldn't let him out of the garage until he could play I Don't Need No Doctor fervently, sort of thing. So his generation took their stuff from us and or our generation. And there's lots of musicians out there like that that we would like to, as we develop this, invite along to the occasional gig. Now, that's not in stone yet, that part of it, but what the building of this band as a working unit, hopefully going out for long periods, this first tour is only three weeks long, but we are adding dates and it's looking good already. It's not until September and we're selling tickets, you know, well. So I'm just really excited about the fact that we can keep the live Humble Pie music alive. And there is, although it's a small consideration, it's an important one. If I don't do it, some smart ass is going to come along and try and do it illegally, uh, you know, and that we have to avoid because we had a lot of that before with our albums. Some of our stuff was released um, unknowingly to me when I was still living in America before I came home after Steve died. It was about a 10-year period before I came home to England. And I had my own version of Humble Pie in America that had been approved by Steve, he gave me the right to use the name. Um, what I didn't know was that there was a group of people putting out illegally 
our catalogue, just not not applying for copyright control or copyright approval, just putting out songs of ours and you know on little backstreet labels, not bothering to um, get the sound right. It was horrible. So I had a lot of things to do with a lot of help from Peter Frampton to clean up our catalog. And now it's out there on Universal or on UMG in beautiful different, you know, there's a vinyl box set, there's a CD box set, and then there's a box set of the live album, but all four performances. And this is quality stuff. So we've got rid of all the backstreet merchants. We've got a fine lineup in Humble Pie, smoking, you know, celebrating 50 years of smoking, Humble Pie legacy. And um, we're thrilled. We can't wait to get it seen, get it started, you know. And please come along and give it, give it a listen, because I'm sure that once people see it, they'll want to see it again and again, because they're a great band. And what better material could you have than our catalogue to play? So that, that's where we're at. Well, no question. I mean, we, we can't wait. Uh, we've been, um, you know, missing it. And like I say, the closest thing is we crank up rocking the film more. But um, what's better than having uh, four great musicians in the flesh and the DNA yeah. of the original band? But Jerry Shirley... Yeah. Uh, going over every step with a fine tooth comb, making sure that um, everyone passes the the test and has the right spirit, the right attitude. And yep. um, I, I, guess, I guess the hardest thing is coming up with the damn set list. You know, you got you <laughs> got like a hundred songs to to choose from. So, um, well, I'm going to leave. They've, they've they've already come up with a couple of interesting dip ones that we haven't done. Which is I love. I love the fact that you know I'm get, I'm giving Bucket a very free hand to be the musical director in this, or oh, the whole band really. They're, these are top professional guys, and they're huge fans of our music. So they're going to make sure they do a brilliant job. Job, and and I'm very proud of all four of them. Jim Stapley's lead vocals and guitar playing are just out of this world. He's not trying to be Steve Marriott. He's just doing his own version of what Steve did, and he's got the range to do it. So, you know, we, we I couldn't be happier, really. Yeah, well, you're a proud papa, no doubt. Um, the baby's uh, uh, coming out and uh, going to grow and grow. And like we say, um, the era of the 70s was always my favorite era. Not only was I growing up uh, as a teenager and, graduating school and going off into the world during that time. But it just seemed like all the um, bands were free to explore and be themselves. And nobody was trying to sound yep. like each other. Of course, so many of you guys were faithfully uh, influenced by our very rich American blues and soul heritage. But, oh yeah, you know, I mean, when the 80s came and MTV came in, it seemed like a lot of labels were like, well, look at Duran Duran. You guys need to look like these guys and, 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 and the police, you need to sound like them. And it, it just became this beginning of this copycat, you know, culture yeah. where um, yeah. cookie cutters were saying, all right, well, let's take some of this and some of that. And we'll throw a crazy name and a crazy haircut on the band and throw it out there. But the seventies were, were the real deal. If you couldn't cut it live, and if you couldn't cut it at a place like the Fillmore, East or West, um, the crowd was going to let you know. <laughs> they, That's they, right. were, they were going to throw some bottles or shoes or something at you, like get oh, off yeah. the stage, you know? Yep. Because yep. uh, Bill, Bill Graham brought the, brought the best of them. And uh, we credit Bill and uh, champion bands like Humble Pie and such great groups to uh, say, you know, mix it up, man. Let's have some rock and soul and funk and jazz and 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 yep. reggae and all all that in the in the set. Yeah, I mean his his builds. When you look at who he had on, there was such an, an eclectic mix of people on on one show. Uh, you know, you'd have 
uh, Miles Davis and the Who or whatever, you know. I'm not saying that was a actual happen, but that you see what I it mean. Might it, have been. It, 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 yeah. uh, it could have been. He had so many shows. Could've... I swear, if we look through the lineups right now, we'd see something like that. No question. And, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you played yeah, on on a lot of those. Like you say, you'd come out to San Francisco and you look at the bill, and there was not a band like you on the bill. There was three oh, other absolutely. bands, yeah. all, all completely different and unique. Yeah, the first time we played the Fillmore West was uh, Grateful Dead were headlining. We were in the middle and Flock were opening, I think. And we had to headline the second night because it was the night of Altamont and Grateful Dead had gone there and realised how bad it was and tried to get away to get back to do their show at the Fillmore but got stuck. So we ended up headlining the Fillmore West when no one knew who we were, and there was about five people there, because, of course, they were all at Altamont. And the great thing about it was they were all knocked out on um, uh, Ripple and Reds, you know, the, the sedative girls called Reds and Ripple, and our biggest achievement was we managed to wake them up. <laughs> Yeah, they were uh, feeling no pain, I'm sure. Yeah, that's right. That was a crazy... I, I've interviewed the uh, tour manager, Ron Schneider, of the Rolling Stones about Altamont, and he yeah. he swears they, they barely got out alive. I mean, they had a helicopter, oh, yeah. but yeah. It, it turned so dark and so so uh, evil that uh, mm -hmm. they, they were lucky to get Mick Jagger and Keith and Charlie and, and, and Mick and you know, um, yep. you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Bill Wyman out, out of the harm's way. And you know what's what's really strange about looking back at my own life is the fact that I was this little. It's like looking at someone else. I was this little seventeen-year-old touring America, having to check into the British consulate at every town we went to because I was effectively underage to play in all these places. And uh, this is Altamont, and I'm just up the road at the Fillmore West headlining because Grateful Dead couldn't be there. And, you know, you can't make that up. I mean, what a privilege to have a life that included just that, apart from anything else. Um, you know, the one final thought about that sort of stuff, because history and all. A friend of mine who helped me get sober, may he, God bless him, he's still with us, and he's still rock and rolling, a drummer called Tony Newman. He used to play in a band called Sounds Incorporated. And when the Beatles toured America, Sounds Incorporated would come with them as their opening act. So someone pointed out to me the other day that between 1965 and 1971, there were three British drummers that played Shea Stadium. The first one was Tony Newman with Sounds Incorporated opening up for the Beatles. The second one was Ringo with the Beatles. And the third one was Little Me with Humble Pie in 1971, and I had no, I didn't even had no idea until weeks ago. Someone pointed that out to me. I mean, what a wonderful! It's like looking at someone else's life. It really is, and what a privilege. Yeah, well, I know the uh, great group Grand Funk had uh, took you under their wing and um, yep. had you play That's with it, them yeah. at Madison Square Garden. For the first time, yep. and then um, as they continue to grow and you guys grow, they still had you under their wing when they played Shea Stadium and broke the Beatles record for the fastest sellout. And yep. uh, we spoke to Mark Farner after our last conversation, and I said, Mark, you know, uh, talking to Jerry Shirley, there seems to be a, um, a talk about after the tour, um, you guys felt um, such camaraderie and a debt to Grand Funk for – uh, helping to uh, uh, break America that um, Steve gave him uh, uh, SG guitar. And mm -hmm. I said, Mark, do you remember that? He said, don't I only remember that? 
he said, I used that guitar for years and I used it exclusively on our next album, E Pluribus Funk, and our song Foot Stomp and Music, which became our opener, you know, from yeah. there on out, was yeah. played on that, uh, I believe, a white SG that uh, yep. Maria what, and Humble Pie had uh, gifted him. And he, he oh, remembered yep. it and loves you guys so much. Yep, it was a white Les Paul custom SG, I think with three pickups, and it had a gold um, hardware on it, and it had a, I think it had a tremolo arm on it, if I remember right. I'm not sure about that, but it was beautiful, and it was actually bought by the band as a spare, so that if one of the guys broke a string, they could use that. In fact, I think there's a picture of either Peter or Steve playing it on one of the pictures of the live album. But pretty soon, uh, yeah, we did. We gave it to Mark. You know, on Steve, on behalf of the band, gave it to Mark. And um, we were very close. The bands, the three guys in their band and us guys, we, we, we just hung out together the whole time. We, we toured all over Europe, all over America, and we were the first band ever to play opening up for them because they'd become so big that didn't get booed off. And that's what impressed them. They thought, well, if you can stand up to our audience and go down as well as we do, or almost as well, you know, equally, then they didn't try and give us off the bill. They kept us on the bill. They loved it. They were real gentlemen about it. And he's a good guy, all three of them. Oh, yeah. Mark, especially. Yeah, Mark uh, has such this? glowing, glowing thoughts. And of course, uh, told us about the Hyde Park show and uh, yeah. that, that big crowd that Humble Pie and Grand Funk played at a massive audience in Hyde Park. And he talks about how they had, uh, I guess, polished the floor or something. The, the stage was um, a, a little slick that he didn't know about. It. And he comes running out there. And hits his knees like he often does and, you know, wails on the guitar. And he slid right off the stage into the crowd. When he first told me the story, yeah, I, I said, I said, you slid into the pit, you know, where the photographers, he said, there was yeah. no pit. He said, I slid right into the crowd. <laughs> well, there was a pit, but I don't think it was very big. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it was, he went past the pit. I, but I, what, it, what, what it was, was the pit was so full of people that it looked like the crowd. So because um, my father and my brother and various girlfriends of the bands and this and that and the rest were sitting in the pit and um, uh, it looked just like you could see a little fence that was supposed to uh, represent the pit, but really it had just disappeared into the audience. Right. It was, there was supposed to be a separation. I, I never knew that. I, I never knew that he slid off the end. <laughs> he, he went right into the crowd. <laughs> wow. and, he, and he didn't he didn't get hurt no he said he was stunned he said he, he climbed up got back on stage and just the raw energy of that crowd and that performance yeah. you know the next morning he may have felt it <laughs> yeah I bet. I bet he but did. <laughs> he, he, he he soldiered on and had a great show and i know uh between shea stadium and hyde park uh two two of the greatest memories of not only Humble yeah. Pie, but of Grand Funk and Mark Farner. And um, yeah, the camaraderie was um, electric. Mark um, um, thanks to you guys every time he plays that guitar and some of their classic songs are recorded with it. Do, do you know whether he still has the guitar? He still has it. He still has, he still has, it, has it to it. this day. He still I'll has it done. to this day. Yeah, I, ta I talk to Mark on a pretty regular basis, so I will um, ask him if he takes it on tour or if it's uh, too precious to take on the road and keeps it in his studio. Um, yeah. he, he's back living in uh, Michigan for a while. He was Is living he down really? in Florida. Oh. But, you know, the band originally from Flint, Michigan, he's uh, he's yeah. up in northern yeah. Michigan. So, you know, he probably just came out of a, a, a pretty hard winter, you know, as it gets to yeah. be. Well, in the upper be sure the upper and, parts be sure. of America. Be sure and send him all my best, please. Do. I sure will. I sure will. I told him what what great chats that we're having and 
I'm so excited about the new uh, Legacy Humble Pie band. And he's he's like, wow, man, those guys were so incredible. Um, I know there's a, a bit of uh, his spirit in uh, your band. And likewise, you know, he's, uh, yeah. he's still out there. But the fact that he told me that um, some of those classics, like Foot Stomping Music and the Aplerbus Funk album, all those songs were uh, played with that SG. So you can go crank wow. up that album right now and uh, feel the spirit of your gift and the camaraderie between the bands. Wonderful stuff. Well, wow. how nice. That's great. <laughs> That's that what it's really all about. Great, great, great memories, yeah. great camaraderie. Yeah. That's what keeps yeah. um, the music alive, you know, even though we've sadly uh, lost Steve Marriott and uh, Greg Ridley, rest in peace. And, um, you know, we're losing a lot of our, our friends, the Jeff Becks and, of course, Sid Barrett early yeah. on and so, so many of them. Um, you know, the, the music, the memories is what makes us appreciate the music that much more. And to me, keeps the spirit alive. And I think yeah. long after all the 60s and 70s bands are gone, um, it's these stories, these great interviews, these uh, great reminiscing of what was uh, behind those songs and albums and tours and the camaraderie on the bills that, um, yep. you know, keeps it fresh in our mind. And I know uh, uh, e even though you won't necessarily be at every show, uh, there's a bit of you at every Humble Pie Legacy show. I know Bobby Marks will feel you uh, behind the drum kit and uh, Jim and uh, Bucket and, and Ivan, um, you know, feel their fearless leader. The general is... Um, is behind us and uh, yeah. the fans are uh, what we do this for. And it, it's such a pleasure yeah. to be a part of uh, yeah. promoting these shows and seeing people reconnect with an amazing catalog and a, a band that will never die like the mighty humble pie. Well, we hope so. And, and, and I think that as time goes by, because these guys were all, they're not youngsters by any means, but they're a little bit younger than we were, or we are. Um, and I think what will happen, because the, the music's not going away, it's still selling, it's still popular, it's still on the radio. And I think as time goes by and the other bands can no longer uh, themselves play, they will too find ways of getting a live appearance version that's sanctioned by the originals. Because if you think about it, it like, all going all the way back to classical music or more recently to Glenn Miller. There's still a Glenn Miller band going out today playing, you know, his material, even though he died in World War II. Uh, classical music, the, when it was first written, a lot of it was not popular at the time. And now, you know, Bach and Beethoven and so on and so on, is you know filling classical music halls all over the world, and has done for years. So I, you know, I think that that's what's going to happen to classic rock, you know, one way or another. When the originals are no longer with us, or they just can't, they're too old to go on the road anymore for health reasons. They'll somehow or other recruit new. Um, um, people to go out and do it for them um no maybe not all of them but i think some will uh, we yeah, certainly well, are Why i not? think um you guys have the integrity of course anybody can form a tribute band but to be a lineage in the dna of the original band with uh that heartfelt uh, alliance and and the camaraderie and support i think is important i mean even the band kiss and of course they have makeup so they said hey when we're done, we'll find four other guys and put them in our character's <laughs> yeah, makeup. Easy. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who, who, anyway, who, who will yeah. know? You know, but yeah. no, there's yeah. um, there's a lot of bands, and there were so many dynamic performers of the '70s. But I'm sure, you know, after uh, Keith Richards or Mick passes, um, they should have another um, band put together and carry on the Rolling Stones, you know, in the spirit um, that they yeah. have and um you know the who and um all, all those deep purple and pink floyd yeah. pink floyd should have a tribute band out there right now that's uh i i know it's a little warring factions between mr waters and gilmore but you know um 
there, there should some some because there's a lot of big tribute bands. There should be an official. Yeah. One. Oh yeah, there are official. Well, there are tribute bands that. Uh, um, I don't know quite how that works with the legalities, but there is the Australian Pink Floyd that seemed to have the approval of the band. I'm not quite sure how that works. There was another. There was a a Beatles band back in the '90s that were huge. They were playing in hundred, two hundred shows a year. And they were uh, identical. You know, they did, they had it down to a T. Everything about them. Of course, they were wearing wigs and things like that, but they looked and sounded exactly like the original Beatles. Um, I can't remember what they were called at the time, but they was were, it Beatlemania. I think there was a band called uh, Beatlemania. I, I, they might have been, but I'm not. I, I know that I saw them playing in Cleveland when I lived there, okay. and they were. They were telling me that they were, eat. They had a, a, had it so well organized. They had a corporation that paid that they all owned, and that they were. And this was in the nineties. Now, yeah, it was practically like a Broadway people. show. I mean, they had their costume changes. They had their yeah, yeah that's right. Videos. They did half of it. They did half the show as the early Beatles and yep, the and then the half. psychedelic Beatles. Yeah, and and they were making something like again. This is in the mid to late nineties, and it was some bizarre amount, like a hundred thousand each a year from gigging. Now, if you turn that in today's money, that's an awful lot of gosh. So that, that my only point about money in in that sense is showing how many people were prepared to show up and see it. You know, and well, and no I did see it. And it, and it was it was very well done, I have to say. Yeah. So anyway, it's been a draw, a joy talking to you, Jay. Awesome, as always, as always. Jerry. It's yeah. um, it's one of my treats um in life to uh, reminisce and uh, love and talk about some of my favorite bands and humble pies right up there with them, and the fact that we can help. Um, link up the links below here to all the dates of Humble Pie Legacy and we'll continue to have updates uh, for you and uh, as more dates roll out and they bring it west of the Mississippi here we'll be um, yep. right there right there in the front you know I know uh, there's a lot of history with um, uh, Humble Pie in California so you gotta bring it you gotta bring it <laughs> LA, San Diego, San Francisco um any, uh, of course, Las Vegas. Of, yeah, there's, there's a lot. We were always popular on the West Coast and we were always popular in the Midwest. So, you know, all of those markets are yet to be um, booked, but they will be. And uh, anytime you want me on the air here, you just let me know. Well, we appreciate that and uh, never abuse the privilege. Always uh, fantastic to have you. I want to encourage everyone to go out and see that Sid Barrett documentary the movie which of course uh mr shirley is in and a prominent part of those two solo albums of the late great sid barrett of pink floyd and keep that catalog get that box set get that expanded performance yep. rocking the fillmore box set i mean we can't get enough of of those classics that you made and and i know uh there's many treats to come jerry thank you so much blessings to you and your family and uh, look forward to our next chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jay. And as always, you're a gentleman and a scholar, and I appreciate our chats. And you take care. Till the next time.